I'll, I'll start and kick us off. Um, so on on the mixtures, um, can you explain now if, if we if we have a problem um, where we need to address uh, a mixture of formulation, uh, what's what's different about the the testing? Uh, using the battery of assays and, and how does that work? Why, why do these assays work well on mixtures and how, how do you deconvolute the, you know, the data analysis? Um, the main reason why they work on, on mixtures is that um, they are robust. So very often more sensitive assays, very differentiated cells, um, are vulnerable to, to um, all kinds of influences. So these are robust cells which can integrate the effect of, of, of mixtures. And if, if you have a reference compound, and since these are defined pathways, we do have reference compounds that are specific for particularly these receptors. Um, you can uh, make an, an, an clear estimate on, on what the level of activity of the receptor would be. And that relates again to the biological effect. For instance, estrogens, we, est we know what 70 beta acetyl does. For dioxins, we know what the di uh, TCDD does. Um, this is the way you can, uh, can benchmark your, your data. And, and what about synergistic effects, where maybe two ingredients in in the in the mixture may may have non-additive effects or 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 are reinforcing the the signal? Yeah, so that's that's the weaker point of these bioassays. Although that's also the weaker the the the, the thing that happens in 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 reality. Reality, if you have an antagonist and an agonist at the same point at time. Uh, then you might not find a, a response. Um, this is something that is sometimes uh, held against the use of bioassays um, in certain analytical uh, areas. Um, and for very critical components, you, you could argue that it, this is important. On the other hand, when you look how uh, how we now access chemicals in mixtures we um the tip of the iceberg pyramid which i showed is not an ex exaggeration it's only a, a handful to maybe a couple of hundreds of, of chemicals that are being measured while well, there's millions around us so um we are missing chemicals all the time which are toxic as well um and um, having an antagonist and an agonist, it doesn't. We, we don't. We, we've not seen so many examples of that. Um, if you would like to to improve on that, you can separate um, using a column fractionation the uh, the elements in 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 a sample, and then see if there's some antagonistic effects, uh, not co eluding with the. Uh, uh, agonistic effect, but that obviously is a, is a much more expensive and much more la labor intensive uh, process. So that's not standardly done. It, it's something to be done, for instance, if you have a very novel um, type of sample, which you're a bit doubtful if, if it's not a complex mixture of all kinds of agonist antagonist, then you could do this as a first shot. Mm -hmm. um, and also, have a, a specific extraction method um, designed that that avoids these kind of problems. Yeah, I mean, it strikes me that the reference compound idea with regards to toxicity pathways is is a is a very useful one. But perhaps um, it, it would be valuable to have like reference mixtures, reference formulations, where we have. Um, very a very additive, simpler model works, but also examples where um, the interactions are more complex and those models break down. Yeah, in in, in practice, we we have reference uh, mixtures, um, um, and certainly we do use spiked uh, samples to 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 uh, assess the recovery of uh, the the analytes from this mixture but 
from a, chem a chemist point of view, um, it, it, it remains a bit, um, uh, it, it's difficult to get it extremely analytical pure um, because you're measuring a range of chemicals that may have have different behaviors um, but that's that's life that's we can't change biology too much <laughs> and um, if we want to be sure what's what's toxic to to humans then we have to to use humans as as experimental animals but that's something that's not that has been done in the past but but that's um to to taste your your food before uh, you start eating it that's the the safest way um but but a very good surrogate in my point to my point point of view is is is, is really the uh, use of uh, of really mechanism-based bioassay bio because you have to know, you have to understand what's happening in your cells to get it analytically uh, relatively pure. It's so, so, so if I had a, a study, um, would it be valuable that I, 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 I could, for example, test my ingredient um at a certain concentration and then also in the formulation and show that my my threshold value was applying in the mixture uh yeah i could do that is that answer your question or <laughs> yeah no I, it's, i'm just wondering is that is that a is that a design that you would recommend or how, what, what, how would you recommend people go about about that if they have they're trying to set a threshold level um, for a particular ingredient that maybe have some have some issues with it um, and you want to set this one of these threshold values for it in the context of the formulation how would you go about that well you have to, first you have to, to to design your your threshold of um what you could do is is do a comparative analysis of of batches that that you think are toxic and and, and non-toxic but then you need a bit more data on the on the uh, toxic chemicals obviously and then you can make make a threshold set at this level i'm considering this toxic um the other thing is is to do a risk assessment based on the uh, the, the type of effect uh, linking to your reference chemical um, and linking that to uh, known data, be it animal studies, human exposure studies. Very often, there are studies on uh, on drugs which also have these similar pathways being affected, and we know at at a certain point these are being uh, uh, being toxic. On the other hand, we have um, also a, a large uh, experience on 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 non-toxic uh, components, for instance, food ingredients, which are on the uh, the grass list, uh, generally accepted as safe, or um, that we know that we can can eat uh, without much much problems a certain amount of a vegetable or whatever, and then you can also establish the the background level of uh, of activity in that. Um, a, a tricky thing. In this is is to uh, get an idea on the uh, the potency in vivo uh, with respect to to the uh, stability of the compound. So that's also why we uh, focus a lot on on um, using metabolic systems to see if a compound is being uh, really very stable or can be rapidly metab metabolized because you see. Uh, a big difference between, for instance, dioxins, which you can't metabolize at all, and uh, very certain food ingredients, which you can very easily metabolize and will not really be a problem if you if you ingest those. So this is another uh, uh, issue to be considered. So I have a, I have a question that has come in from Eric Hutov, and he'd like to ask for regulatory use. Is yeah. testing and reporting by OEC guidelines under GLP required? And is that offered with the Calix system? Um, that's a difficult question for me, Eric. <laughs> uh, 
Um, actually, I don't know the, the answer. Um, you, you get different answers from different regulators uh, in practice. So they, in general, OECD uh, guidelines, which are very um, detailed described for our, for our, our essays, for instance, you have a 50 page uh, protocol uh, to, to go through. And that's uh, quite sufficient. We use on, uh, on, on, on using ISO standards. We could also introduce GLP, but that would be um, an additional cost factor. And since the market is still a bit hesitant, that's, uh, we don't offer this at this moment. Um, but um, if Eric and, and, and colleagues are uh, um, enthusiastic, uh, uh, enthusiastic in, in using our essays, obviously that can be set up. We, we use uh, in our lab, we use uh, practically the same uh, standards as GLP. So what, what, what would be the current situation if we have um, a reader cross case? Uh, can, can the Calx assays be used to support a read across and, and, and that could be used in, in a submission for, um, you know, with regards to Annex 11, uh, supporting guidance um, for for reach purposes is is that is that something that has been done or could be done? Sure, that could be uh, could be done. Um, we have done this um, in the context of a project, the Etoxris project, as you know, uh, using our essays in that uh, as a read across part of a read across argument. Um, yeah, you can do that. We can do that with 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 Invitro essays. Um, you don't necessarily need need a GLP essay, but obviously, if it's done under uh, with an OECD guideline on the GLP, the the arguments become stronger and stronger. Um, so yeah, that's the answer. It's it depends obviously on the read across question. If it's really uh, clear that for instance, with the bisphenols, there's an endocrine call on this on the on these compounds. You could really uh, use those assays in a read across context. The 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 other thing which I I, I can't control is if if ECAC accept this is or not. That's um, we don't have experience with that at this stage. So so say I was trying to understand the. <clears throat> Toxicological profiles of my compound or or group of compounds. Uh, how how would the the profile information I get from this uh, Calox panel compared to, for example, a, um, a Toxcast profile? Um, it's it's different and and similar uh, in a way. It's both profiles are not considering all possible mechanisms that are in in, in a organism um, that's that's on do, do, doable but on the other hand um, if you have a defined set of mechanisms that you know that are frequent uh, targets of toxicants it's it's clear that you can pick out the re really reactive compounds and uh, the, 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 the most most of the toxic ones, um, and that can be further improved in, in time. So we are particularly strong in the endocrine active uh, in, in the endocrine uh, setting. Um, Toxcast has some other uh, assays, uh, G coupled receptors uh, uh, assays, which is not which are not in the uh, in the calyx panel. Um, these are also that's a, a huge group of uh, of receptors, um, and it would be uh, quite a, a thing to to introduce those. Um, but also there you you can see like with the also with the steroid receptors and related pathways that not all um, pathways are, are hit by by chemicals. Um, and as you know a little bit about 
uh, drug development, there are certain targets that, that are very uh, frequently hit by drugs. So they can use this for new drug development, while others, um, although there is uh, an important receptor, although there's um, endogenous ligands, um, very often protein ligands, there's no way in, in which you can influence that with a uh, synthetic chemical. Uh, saying no way with, within a reasonable dosing uh, uh, regime. So you have to uh, put crazy amounts to get a response. And that depends on yeah the structure of the interactions of the molecules. And uh, for instance, with the steroid receptors, they, those are uh, made to to interact with the li small lipophilic co compounds, and, and very many of them resemble certain chemistries that are used in, in industrial chemicals. So that's one reason why they are hit quite frequently. Um, yeah. So, and 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 a similar uh, approach is is taken by by Toxcast, I think. So as, as the cost of omics is being driven down, it it's, um, becomes more interesting to run toxicogenomics-like experiments where we can get a more complete profile across uh, a, a large number of targets in in, in those in those um, kind of dose responses. Um, so how how do you think today those sorts of profiles compare to the battery assay approach and and uh, are they complementary? Can they be used in combination? Uh, where where do you see the field going with the use, you know, the increasing use of omics at lower cost? Yeah, I, I, that's a good question. I uh, we worked on omics uh, quite a bit, and and we left this a bit because it's particularly with the complex mixtures you have uh, uh, a lot of problems in uh, seeing the the pathways. Um, and and knowing what which pathway is being affect, uh, affected, uh, time issues uh, lead to very different uh, sets of genes being activated, and the issue that we just ad addressed is even more important. If you have all kinds of pathways interacting, if you then have a complex mixture of of chemicals or a chemical that does different things, it may in the end lead to nothing happening while there's still certain pathways being activated that sort of uh, lead to no response. So there, there we left it, but you're right, it, it, it becomes much more, uh, much cheaper. So having a, um, uh, a quite an extensive set of data from, from omics, because I think you need that. It's not useful to have a single dose, single time point, because that doesn't tell you anything. Um, will be uh, is is complementary to to this uh, focused approach. Mm -hmm. It's it's I think like chemistry and bi uh, bioassays. These are also complementary. One does one part of the job better, and the other does another part of the job better. So having, for me, it's it's really these omics uh, tools are. Um, um, are very useful, uh, sort of satisfying the, the 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 question. If you do a read across, uh, have a read across argument, say, well, this compound doesn't do what uh, the parent compound does. Huh? It's, it doesn't have a endocrine profile. But then the, the the question pops up. Yeah, but maybe it does something really awkward differently. There you have. These, with these omic tools, um, if you then see nothing happening, um, that that gives a strong argument to say, well, in a really, it seems to be pretty safe. So I mean, they, they could cross verify each other if if the omics is suggesting um, a particular gene signature, maybe a pathway analysis, then. I can actually verify it in your assays that it really is being expressed and is functional. Yeah, that's another way of, of looking at it. And I know that you are working on that. Um, and that's also very promising because um, all these interactions that can occur in, in uh, these more complicated cell system, because in how much you typically use a cell which can does all kinds of things, uh, you can 
um, yeah, avoid and, and uh, focus on a particular pathway that pops up as being relevant. And then you can very critically, analytically de define uh, if this pathway is being affected or not. And, of, uh, uh, and for instance, if you have um, ideally some other ca candidate chemicals can pick out the, 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 the most promising one. So that would be the green chemistry approach which is, I think, the future. Uh... So, so you mentioned um, model accuracy. What about um, the issues with, um, you know, sensitivity and specificity, and how, how, how do you address these false positive and false negative issues with, with, um, with, with, with compounds and, and have more confidence in the results? Yeah, obviously we do a lot of validation, so we test all known chemicals that are um, known to affect certain pathways, so you can uh, look at the, the accuracy of the assay. Um, the sensitivity, we have usually have quite sensitive assays, which is nice for certain applications. For other applications, people are a little bit getting a little bit scared they they prefer a little bit less sensitive assays and that's what i brought up with the the uh, um the issue of of thresholds um i think that's very important to to define um don't go for the the least sensitive assay and say well i'm fine <laughs> because that's uh, hiding your hand in the head in the sand a little bit but go for a sensitive assay and say, well, this is this is not activated, then you're really safe, or activated at the level of a reference chemical, which you know is really not not a problem. Um, and uh, I was pretty surprised, for for instance, with the estrogen reporter assay, which is one of the most sensitive assays which we have, that when we tested chemicals and we don't test uh, usually uh, sugar and and salt but really the, the pesticides and all the the toxic ones that are on lists of uh, of considered to be harmful um that about 88 percent was not active at all in in our even in our estrogen screen at, at the highest dose and there you can really also uh, you have reference in vivo models, where you can, you can use those as a benchmark, and uh, these reference models are much less sensitive, uh, and you can really predict that at a certain level of activity in 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 this assay, uh, and certainly if there's no activity, that there's no way that you will have a eutrotrophic uh, response in, in an animal. So that's the way we we go about that. What, what about applicability domain? How, how how do we know that my my chemicals are um, going to work, you know, with your assays and be you know be within the applicability domain that the assays are covering? So yeah, I have again, some unusual. Maybe I have some chemicals which are a little different uh, to to your references and or to the what you're usually putting through. How, how do we and and particularly looking at the chemistry of of the compounds um i think that's something which is a little bit neglected by our validation friends from ecfam oecd uh, when i started um already quite a considerable time ago on uh, in validation studies i had the impression well uh for instance Sol solubility of a compound, volatility of a compound, these are issues um, that are applicable to almost any uh, in vitro test. There's not, not a big difference. We all have our cells in plastic wells and, and um, add, in, uh, add them in uh, the, 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 the compounds with certain media, with serum, um, and there are some there's some variation and there's some differences, but 
this is 90%, 99% of what, what people are doing. So um, I would expect a sort of a guidance document and it, to some extent it's it's available in the uh, um, uh, and, and being generated now and now um, but it has been quite slow that uh, uh, how to deal with these issues and having our relatively robust cells um, I have to say we can some uh, treat them a little bit uh, um, differently than than a, a long time uh, a cell that need, needs to be cultured for a long time. We typically have 24 hours exposure or even shorter. And for instance, for volatile compounds, we can cover the, the wells and then the, the cells are behaving quite well still. Um, and um, we can have uh, very nice results with, with those compounds. Um, and that those yeah, kind of issues are important to consider in, uh, in, in testing that it's not always the, uh, and certainly not the way the, the chemical will behave in, in vivo will be the, the way it behaves in vitro. So that's an important aspect to, to consider. So, so, but, yeah. so, so, so what do you think would be the, um, um, uh, the, the role of increased use of, of modeling to, to, to help, um, yeah, provide, uh, more in silico evidence that can be com combined with, um, the results I'm getting from the assays to make them more interpretable to increase our, our confidence in our, inter our our analysis of the assay results. Sure, sure, that's that's very important because you can model with chemicals that behave very strangely in 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 vitro uh, if you have the right reference uh, data. You can still uh, make good predictions, and you could also help uh, assessing. Uh, how a chemical would behave in 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 in, in a culture. Um, obviously, that's also an an area which is still under development. As for instance, in this Resolve project, we were working with uh, um, very good chemists that were really um, very experienced in in predicting what a sol what chemical would be a solvent. And even sometimes they predicted that it would be a, a liquid, and then it was was not a liquid. It, <laughs> it was hard as stone. So th th there's also there's limits. But I think really um, uh, there's also extremely good synergistic possibilities because we cannot. We had some chemicals that floated on top of of our culture medium, and others sank to the bottom. Well you can tell that you have a very different exposure regime uh, if you have the floating ones compare uh, and you compare it with the, the the one at the bottom so and that's also one thing which is interesting for this sort of green chemistry approach there you have usually chemicals that are in a certain group they behave quite similar then you can pick out the uh, uh, very easily the the, the the toxic versus the non-toxic uh, uh, chemical. If you have very different chemistries, it becomes much more diff difficult, and then you have have to have uh, these these also these in silico predictions and other kind of predictions to to, to consider. And also have a good look at your cells, how they behave, and <laughs> and how the compound behaves in your um, during mixture with your culture medium so does it precipitate or not uh, uh, does it pre precipitate when you put it on your cells or is it floating or whatever yeah well bart it's been absolutely fascinating thank you for sharing your knowledge um we'll be making the uh webinar available online shortly thank you audience